Hello and welcome to another episode of Soul Nectar Show, that show where we talk about all things essence, where we gather around the campfire and we share our stories of connection to that which is bigger than us, to the big mystery, to the divine unfolding, to all those synchronistic breadcrumbs that we follow on our journey through life. And I'm your host, Carrie Hummingbird. I love these conversations, uh, whether it's a guest on my show or whether it's in one of my butterfly circles. These are the conversations I live for. You know, just that discovery process of who you are as a person and why you're here and why some of the things are happening and, and the sense that we make of all of it. And so I welcome you to check out my website if you're interested in my work, carriehummingbird.com, K-E-R-R-I, hummingbird.com. And today's guest is Randy Fine. Welcome, Randy. Hi, Carrie. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm glad, glad you're here. Yeah, we had a wonderful conversation on Randy's show, uh, Find Time for Healing. I'll put a link to that in the show notes so you can check that out. And more about Randy. Randy is a dedicated pioneer in the narcissistic abuse movement and a narcissistic personality disorder abuse expert. She is a radio show host, an author, and a coach counselor living in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And through her wealth of experience, insight, and wisdom, she offers hope, compassion, and healing to others. Randy is the author author of the groundbreaking book, Close Encounters of the Worst Kind, The Narcissistic Abuse Survivor's Guide to Healing and Recovery. And she's also has a new compelling memoir out, uh, Cliff Edge Road. And so um, just want to encourage you, I'll be putting more information about Randy. She's got a blog about narcissistic abuse and, and she's got just a, a lot of um, beautiful work she's doing in the world. So I'll be putting that out in the show notes for you to check out after the show. And so Randy, I always start people off with you know, how did you get started in this work? When was, what was your awakening moment that, hey, there was something more for you than whatever it was you were experiencing and there was a greater purpose? Yeah, thanks for asking. You know, in my 40s, I developed this, my, my narcissistic person, my problem is my mother. I shouldn't say my problem, but that's where this all started. I have a narcissistic mother. And so in my 40s, I didn't know that she was narcissistic because she's very covert and I never knew it and I was her favorite. All of a sudden I developed this, uh, I couldn't stand the sound of her voice, I couldn't stand to be around her. And I was having um, just a lot of emotional issues. So I went into therapy and I learned that I was having boundary issues because when you grow up in a family, with narcissistic abuse, there are no boundaries, so you don't develop any boundaries. And so I began to work on the boundaries, and through that, you know, I sort of set them with my mother, but I really wasn't, I really didn't know that she suffered from narcissistic personality disorder. My therapist threw it out there once, but they generally won't, won't diagnose anybody until they've actually sat with the person. And you never sit with a narcissist, very rarely. So anyway, once I began looking into this, it just, it was like, oh my gosh, this describes my life. This describes my pain. This describes the crazy, frustrating road that I've been on for so many years. The decisions that I made, why I made them, the codependency, every single thing. And so I decided to really start learning more about it. I learned about it. I began writing about it, speaking about it. People began to ask me, can you help me? And so I started coaching practice and um, I've been doing this for many, many years and just helping people writing about it, writing books. I also wrote my book, Cliff Edge Road. Um, this is actually the book, Cliff Edge Road. This is my whole journey. This explains from the beginning um, and how I got through that journey. And it's an amazing story because there's a lot of synchronicity in there, um, but there's a really, really amazing ending that I have to say for you. I can't tell you about it because then you won't read the book, but something in my life very devastating happened to me in my 20s. And it was resolved 30 years later, miraculously. So, um, yeah, that's kind of my story. That's amazing. You know, I feel like you and I probably share some similar um, pathways 
Um, it's like an interesting thing to be the favorite and then to not be the favorite anymore and to be on the other side of that. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about that I find is that um, it's sort of like when you start to claim your own power or your own voice and put boundaries around that is when you're not the favorite anymore. Right. Yeah. And I had, and, and you lose your siblings, you, you, you lose your extended family because nobody really believes what you're telling them. This is an invisible, it's invisible to the rest of the world. It only affects people behind closed doors on a very personal level and no one else sees it because the narcissist, um, the face that they show to the public is charismatic, loving, empathetic, everything you could imagine. And so nobody sees what the family sees. Or uh, this happens in relationships too, uh, marriages, relationships. Nobody sees what happens behind closed doors in those situations. But it is, in my opinion, the worst kind of abuse anyone could ever suffer. It's mind control, brainwashing, um, psychological abuse, emotional abuse. Um, there's rarely any physical abuse, but they don't need to abuse you physically because what they can do to your mind is far worse and more devastating in the long run. So tell us a little bit more about this because I, you know, I've been grappling with this my whole life and I also feel like, well, I'm a big feeler. So that's, you know, I've got like a lot of empathy feeling muscles, mostly because I had to develop them to protect myself, you know, to figure out when things were, you know, to kind of figure out what's true. Like what's, what is true here? You know, cause I didn't, it, things were always confusing. I've always been, I think I've been confused a good part of my life. So like trying to figure out what's true has been really hard for me. Um, I think that, um, how do you know that you're in this kind of relationship? Let's start there because I think maybe people, it's so hard to tell, like it took you till you were 40. It took me there till about then too, like till I was really acting out and a lot of crazy things were going on for me. And I'm like, why am I acting out this way? Like, why am I self-abusing? Why am I you know, acting out in crazy ways? Like what's going on with me? Well, how come I'm like falling apart at the seams? Yeah. Um, so it's rare to, to become aware of this kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> this kind of abuse um, until you're in your forties or fifties, sometimes even sixties. But if the abuse is overt, meaning that it's obvious that you've been pounded on emotionally for your entire life. <clears throat> um, people come to terms with that a lot younger and a lot quicker. <clears throat> so let me drink some water. <clears throat> okay. um, <clears throat> but with the covert abuse, it really messes with your mind because nothing is as it seemed. <clears throat> and to believe that you lived however many years it was, 40 years, 50 years, 30 years, whatever it is, to believe that you lived a lie and that the person that you trusted was only a facade. There was never even a real person there. And so everything that went on was just a facade. And how do you wrap your mind around that? How do you begin to look at that? Because we're logical thinkers. Our minds don't go to those places. And also the thing about narcissists is that they look like we do. They talk like we do. They act like we do because they're students of human nature. So they know exactly what to do in every situation. They study it for their entire life because this is something that forms in their childhood. So as a survival, uh, in order to get what they need to get and abuse people, um, they have to fit in, you know? Do you think they mean to abuse people or do you think it's just from wounding, their own wounding? No, it, they mean to abuse people. And I'll tell you why I say that. If you've had, if you've lived with a narcissist, if you've experienced a narcissist, you will know that what they do in private is very different than what they do in public. And they can switch it 
in a second. So they can be giving you a dirty look and then, hi, how are you? And they can flip back and forth. They know when to abuse. And because they know when to abuse, to me, it's a conscious choice. They do it for survival. They abuse for survival because what they need, their drug of choice is narcissistic supply. And narcissistic supply is adoration, admiration, and attention. And they need this 24 seven. They never, it, it's never enough and they can't hold on to it. So anything that you give them is not retained. So what you find is you don't ever accumulate any brownie points because it's always, well, what are you doing for me now? And if you're not doing it for them in the moment, what they want, it's as if you gave nothing. When in fact, you've given years of pleasing and coddling um, and sacrificing yourself in order to be able to live in this environment. So it's very hurtful and you wonder, well, why can't, why don't they see all the things that I've done in the past? Doesn't matter. It's only what you're doing for them now. So narcissistic supply is um, when, when the disorder forms, it usually forms in childhood and it forms because somebody has suffered severe abuse, humiliation, um, the bar is set too high for them, they can't reach it. Whatever the oppression is in the childhood, this is the child who says to themselves, I don't want this reality, this is not me, and I don't accept it. And they build what's called a false self around them. And the job of the false self is to go out into life and totally shield the true self. So the true self is this pained little, you know, person inside that doesn't want to ever feel that again. And, but when they take on the false self, they lose the ability to generate any positive feelings inside. Mm. So they have to get everything externally from that point on. When they, lo they lose a, a, the ability to empathize, they lose the ability to love, and they lose the ability to generate anything inside. So everything has to come from other people. And it doesn't stick stick. It just, you know, they're always trying to get it. And the abuse is to guarantee a captive supply. So whether it's having children or getting into a relationship or marrying somebody, whatever it is, um, they are basically taking you hostage so that they can feed on you as much as they want to. And, you know, adoration, admiration, and attention. Attention, you know how they say um, children, they'll take negative or positive attention as long as they're getting attention. Well, the narcissist will do the same. So they don't care what they're saying to you and what you're saying to them. It doesn't matter as long as you are giving them some sort of your emotional needs, as long as you're responding and reacting. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I can identify with the responding and reacting thing. It's almost like, um, it's like I've noticed the inability to have like a, just a reasonable conversation about feelings, but it like, it needs to be like this big rage or something like this, this big raging thing where like a bunch of like really hurtful energy is just hurled at you. And it's just like to get you to, to react or to be in pain or to be responding with like emotion, almost like to just create a drama. And when you don't engage in it and you just kind of like witness it with love, like, wow, okay, like I really see you're upset. You know, there's a lot going on and I'm not taking it personally. It's not mine. It's like, it's not satisfying. And then we almost get upset. Like you didn't hear them or something like you didn't respond in kind you didn't get hooked into the cycle so it's not it's not sufficient right they feed on emotion that's their food you know and if you think of you know they're, they're parasites and the predators so if you think about the parasites that you know ticks fleas 
mosquitoes, whatever it, whatever it may be. Um, their whole day is about finding a host, uh, a warm um, mammal of some sort to get some blood from. Narcissists are the same. They are that fo narrowly focused on getting narcissistic supply. And yes, they don't like when you don't react. And that drives them insane um, because they need your emotion. They also seem to like really enjoy hurting you. Like, like to get pleasure out of games, like psychological games, like um, even ignoring you or just saying, well, you don't matter to me now, you're out. Or, you know, and creating, like I've experienced that where it, it's like, um, and, it, and because it's covert, right? Nobody believes me. They think I'm the one who's like got the problems because I'm the one that always has had the problems. I've been the one in psychotherapy. I've been the one, you know, like <laughs> going to try to figure out what's wrong here. <coughs> like what's wrong with me? And I had early childhood abuse. So, um, so I had a lot, you know, it was, it was um, confusing. Like, where does this abuse come from? Why am I, you know, why am I so screwed up? What's going on with me? And, and really I, I look back now and I say, well, I was going through actually pretty normal things in my teens and, and there was, I'm glad that I got into psychotherapy because I got a chance to understand myself better. Um, but like the idea that I was broken or flawed inside is actually not true. And I just needed to figure out how to love myself a little bit better. The, the, the issue was that, that there had to be something wrong with me in order to have this dynamic going on where I would constantly be giving my, my power away to this other person, you know, and then I recreated that for myself too. So talk about that because, you know, when you're, I think you were raised by in this pattern, it becomes part of your psychology too. And so how do you then extricate yourself and become aware of these patterns so you can be, be more normal like other people you know, like seem to be, like they have normal relationships? Yeah. Um, so we really begin to notice the difference between us and the parent, or it becomes a lot more obvious when we get to adolescence, 13, 14, preteen, teenagers, when this self is emerging this individuality is emerging and we are just, we can't hold it back. For a narcissistic parent, that is the biggest threat because mm -hmm. that means they'll lose you. So they spend all those years stealing yourself from you. They don't allow you to develop a self. They, mm -hmm. don't, they don't teach you boundaries. They don't teach you coping mechanisms. And anytime you express that your self is bigger and different, that you want to do something different than they want you to do. They, if it's rage, it's anger, it's threats, it's, it's abuse, emotional abuse to try to put you back in your, in your little, you know, in the little pocket that they want to keep you in, but you get to be 13 or 14 years old and this self begins to emerge. And that's when conflict really begins. And so, while you're just doing what's normal for a teenager to do and spending those years from maybe 14 to 18, just being a kid, being a teenager, just learning, they can't stand it because it's not what they want for you. And yes, you know, so you, what I find, I found it with myself, my sisters, I find it with um, everyone that I work with who has had childhood narcissistic abuse, you get to that age, maybe you're going to college, 18 years old, you're sort of going out into the world, and everybody that you know is sort of going on an incline. They have a goal, they're sort of, you know, moving in a direction. And those of us who have been abused narcissistically, we get to that age and we just plummet because we have no life skills. We've been taught nothing about how to live, how to cope. So we get into drugs, we get into bad relationships, we get into alcoholism, um, you know, all these things that are just because we have no um, foundation under us. We just are out there flailing, trying to figure it out. And it's very painful and you end up 
in seeking out bad relationships, um, feeling like you're worthless, um, you know, and the abuse, the reason, you know, you were talking about how, um, how painful it is, the things that they do, that they seem to enjoy it. That's absolutely true. They are very... It's so hard to believe that. that It's just so awful. Like I... So what I noticed just being like a second generation, who knows, maybe third generation, there was talk about my grandma, you know, so being abusive, um, is that I... My life has felt like this. Like, like I'll get up steam and then I'll be successful and then like, bam, I'll just self-destruct and everything will fall apart. And then like, get back up there again and be like, okay, I can do it. And then bam, I just like fall back again. And like, like, I was just like, I have so much steam and so much like potential, but then it just wasn't ever getting enough traction. Like it, or I would just self-destruct or it would, you know, I would, I would get into a bout of depression or like really awful, like, um thinking in my brain and, and then just these, these terrible feelings pulling me back down again. And, um, and so, and a part of that was too, I got in the same dynamic, right? I got into a partnership where I had the exact same dynamic. So um, I thought, how can people get themselves? It seems to me like you've got to, on my own journey, I had to get a sense of wholeness. Like I had to bring, I had to get a, I had to get a foundation. Like I had to get a strong spiritual practice, because things didn't change for me until I found God, like just to say that. And I had to get a strong spiritual practice and then start like reclaiming myself, like all the pieces and, and then being very vulnerable and transparent and like, you know, being with the icky parts of me that I didn't want to see. I had to actually like expose that, be with that. Is that what you see as part of the healing journey for somebody who's been infected by this virus? And like, how do, how do we heal? Okay, so yeah, the, the, the foundation, you know, and that roller coaster thing, that's, that's what it is. It's like a roller coaster ride through life. You're up, you're down. Um, so it, being, uh, growing up in a narcissistic abuse, a narcissistically abusive home, your life is built on a house of cards. Mm-hmm. And that's what you're describing. It's like you build it up and then bam, the wind comes and down it goes. So it is about creating a foundation, but the core of the healing from this is learning to love yourself and learning that you will protect yourself at any cost. And that's a very hard concept for someone who's been told that that's a selfish thing to do. Um, So, Because there's so much brainwashing and mind control, there's programming that goes on. Um, It's very difficult to overcome this on your own. You really need somebody who knows how to um, sort of help you reprogram, Mm -hmm. deprogram all that stuff and reprogram all that stuff and put good stuff in. But, you know, I know people who come to me come very, very broken for the most part. Some of them have done some work and are a little bit better, but most people are very, very broken. They're as raw as raw can be. And so the first step is being able to look at what happened without hiding your feelings, without um, shying away from anything gradually be able to look at exactly what happened and understand the dynamics and who you were and who that abuser was and how this was never about you. Never. You Mm -hmm. came into the world, this perfectly healthy baby. And had you been with a different family, you would have been a a completely different person. Um, But because you were in this family, you were told things from the time you were born. You were programmed. It's a cult. It's the same kind of mechanism to keep you stuck in a mindset. So so to heal, it really helps to have someone who knows how to help you get out of this, who can recognize it, reinforce the things about you, teach you things like boundaries and self-love. 
and give you the right to be you, you wouldn't believe how many people, you know, I say, you are perfectly fine. They'll say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm such a mess. I'm so embarrassed. I'm like, no, you're perfectly fine. And, and, you're, and it doesn't matter. You're okay just because you are. You know? Well, there's a big thing about being, it's like, um, also another part of my journey has been not wanting to be like my mom, like not wanting to rage and hurt people. So like coming to terms with my own anger and how to express it appropriately and how to be okay with the fact that I am a human being that has anger and you know, when it comes up to be able to healthily express it. So like I suppressed that for a lot because also there wasn't really space for me to be angry in my family of origin because I'm not allowed to be angry. Like I'm just supposed to receive anger on behalf of other people, but then not actually express my own feelings or there's no room for me in that dynamic. Right. right. So I, I didn't have, that's why, why do you think I'm out here? You know, all of a sudden I found out, I started sharing on social media and I started finding out, oh, people like me. Like I actually have something <laughs> worthwhile to say. People are curious. Oh my gosh, like there's a space where I can speak and no matter how awful it is, people can come in and they say, oh, I feel with you. I feel that too. It was amazing. And as soon as that happened, it's like everything fell apart at home, you know, like with my, with my mom. Um, she hates the fact that I do this and it really gets her angry. So um, so now, of course, the whole family is shut down. But what I found is that I, I pass along some of this to my kids, not knowing what, when I was still trying to figure out what was going on. And, um, you know, I had kids at 30, you know, so it's, I'm 50 now. It's been 20 years, you know, of really like looking at this going, what is going on? You know, like, I want to be loving to my kids. I want to be, you know, right there for them. And I don't want to ever yell at them. So I actually never really put really, really strong boundaries because I, I didn't want to yell at my kids, you mm -hmm. know, like I never wanted to do that. I never want to be like that. So it's then the other extreme. I, yeah, I went the other extreme and then I was a marshmallow. You know? <laughs> and then my kids are like, where's my strong mom? And I'm like, not, you know, not until recently. So I started getting my strength. And then like over the last um, six, seven years, especially I've gotten very strong. And then my kids are like, who is this? You know, then it doesn't feel loving because I'm strong now and I'm like holding them accountable and I'm like, no, that's your stuff on your side. And no, this is my stuff on this side and I'm not going to take it on. And they're like, what happened? So like everybody's confused now. <laughs> so I feel like it's okay though. What do you think, Randy? I mean, we're all in a learning yeah, it, process. It is, okay. it is. It is. You know, whatever you do when you don't, when you don't know better, what's that expression? Um, you do what you do. You do what you do until you know better. When you know better, you do better. Um, so, yeah, you know, I've apologized. I've backtracked and apologized to my adult children and said, I, I am so sorry I did that. You know, and they're like, Mom, it's okay. You know, you were different then. Well, my daughter, um, who's now 35, was a little girl. I used to get so angry at things. And I started to notice she was like three years old and she would say to me in the morning, Mommy, I had a I had a dream last night and in the dream you were angry at me. She was saying that to me very often. And I thought, what am I doing to this kid? What am I doing? So I got myself help. Um, and I learned to be, I started meditating. <laughs> um, and I learned, I took transcendental meditation and I learned to control that anger and I changed who I was. But I raised my children basically with a lot of boundaries. My kids have really strong boundaries. Um, and I did it with a soft voice. If my voice went up a decibel or two, they knew they better watch it. But it was always very calm. <laughs> Yeah, me too. I like I had to be because I was in psychotherapy from the time I was fifteen. So I was like this. I I never wanted to express any anger. I never wanted to. I wanted to be like so flatlined almost. Mm -hmm. But then I couldn't because I'm an emotional being, right? So then I would I would like have emotions spill out of me, and then I would like self judge because I was emotional. Like it was like, anyway. <laughs> it's been a big journey of like figuring out how to be comfortable with this mm -hmm. human experience and and to not like damage somebody, right? Like. 
And then I still ended up doing it because they told me to my, we've had conversations. My 17 year old's like, mom, you did this and you did that and you did this and it was awful and you ignored me or whatever you on, you're busy on your, on your business. And we've had like all these conversations and it's so uncomfortable to hear that. You know, it's so, so uncomfortable to keep your heart open when your kid's telling you basically like you screwed me up and I didn't like this. And I, yeah, I, said I think kids, every parent hears, but whatever. Yeah, my it's kids so hard. are teenagers. I'm like, tell me now. Tell me everything I've done wrong. I don't need you in therapy at 30. <laughs> let's yeah, just do it, it now. Let's, let's have it out. Tell me what I've done wrong. And, and they didn't. My daughter really reserved some things. She was a real pleaser child. Um, just a very goody goody. She's not like that anymore. But um, Oh, good for her. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. My daughter was the kind of child who would always start off the first in the line. And everybody would get in front of her and she'd end up being at the end. And I used to say, you have to be a little more assertive. And she just didn't, she couldn't even scream. She couldn't even, like, she would go, I'd say scream. She'd go, ah! She, could. <laughs> she was just really this gentle soul. Now she's a pistol. She's a woman in the corporate world. She's a pistol. So it all, it all worked out just fine. Um, but so back to that thing about being who you are. When I give people permission to be who they are, they go, really? I can just do what I want to do. I can really make my own decisions, even if they're different than what other people want from me. It's such a foreign <laughs> concept. To yeah, people. I remember that. <laughs> it's so foreign. And I'm like, no. And how you feel is how you feel. It doesn't matter if anybody agrees with you it's, it's you. It's what you need. As long as you're not hurting anybody, you can do what you want, say what you want, as long as you're not hurting anybody. So being yourself and going through life with this unique identity is a beautiful, beautiful thing. But it's many people need permission to claim that. Well, when you've been a victim of this kind of, or I hate to use that word victim, because I just so tired of that idea. But when you've been infected with this virus, let's call it that, um, you, in my experience, you sort of feel like, how do I be in relationship with other people? Like there's a discomfort actually, like I feel it inside of me with my kids, like there's this discomfort if they're doing a normal boundary, like they're setting a normal boundary. It's normal. They're 17 and 20. They're like, mom, get out of my space. I'm going to be myself, right? Like, I don't need you constantly like reaching out and saying, hello, I love you. Like, get out, you know, this normal, you know, to be like that. It would be abnormal if they were like just on me and not wanting to leave, right? That would be weird, you know? So it's good that they want to get out. But there's this part of me that's like, it feels like rejection and abandonment because of my mom and what she's done with the whole family, like mm -hmm. closed ranks, like, okay, now I'm her only child. But so like now that I'm not her person to do what she wants and I'm out here and I've got an audience and people are listening to me and I'm doing my thing, even though it's beautiful to everybody else, they're like, this is great. You know, you say a lot of good things or you have a lot of helpful conversations like this one we're having and um, she hates it. So mm -hmm. The whole family, she takes it as a personal attack. And so the right. whole family has like closed ranks and they're like, no, you can't be in our family anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, except for one brother, like my stepbrother. Well, what happens is in a narcissistic family, everyone is in survival mode. So you think of it as a cohesive family because of the word family, the word mother, the word father, the word family. These are emotionally charged words that come with, um, you know, a whole set of beliefs. So, but a narcissistic family is not a cohesive family. Everybody's in their own corner trying to survive. So what happens is when somebody, and I find, so you're an only child, but in families where there's more than one child, only one child rises up out of this. And the reason is because when they move out of the way from the crumbs that they were getting, everybody goes in for their share of crumbs. But that has happened because I have stepbrothers and, and, uh, other people who like a cousin who is a, the next generation down, who's become the next daughter. See? Mm -hmm. So, and, and then my mom's is getting a chance to be the grandmother now again to the next set. Right. So it's like, it's like, step aside. I have my new perfect emissary. 
And unfortunately, there's a lot of wounding there too, because this, this woman has been, had difficulties with her parents fighting, fighting for her in court, even her whole life, this battle. Oh so God. she's like the perfect setup for this mm -hmm. twisted pattern. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. My mother, you know, my mother said to me almost every day of my life, what would I ever do without you? What would I ever do without you? I, what, what if I didn't have you? Uh, you know, you're my everything. You're blah, 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 blah. When I had to go into my healing bubble for a little while and I had to separate from my parents because I couldn't do it while I was still talking to them because the sound of my mother's voice was like, you know, horrible. I, so, yeah. <laughs> and just seeing her was horrible. So I had to sort of push them to the side for a little while. My mother replaced me like that. Yeah, I had the same thing. Like that. Mm -hmm. And it was with cousins who we never had anything to do with but i came to find out that their mother was narcissistic so they were prime because they didn't do the work they just jumped right in and they took my spot well my cousin is a studying psychotherapy so i hope that she <laughs> um gets some tools really quickly to understand what's happening here and not be deceived by it and then hurt by it down the road when she finally realizes what's been going on Right. But we can't, you know, we can't, you can't say that because we they can't, just, we can't worry about people's hurts because, you know, another thing that I've learned mm. and I learned this with my children and I learned it, you know, with all the clients that I work with, because people come to me and they're hurting. What I learned is that everybody comes into life with their own trajectory, their own journey, their own set of things that they have to learn. And it's not for us to interfere or to try to um, quell somebody's pain or problems. It's one thing to give them the hand up and to be there for them and try to help them. But they have their own trajectory. Even our children, you know, they are, they're born from us, but they're not ours. And just like we have had our own path that we've had to walk and learn the hard, you know, the hard way, you and I, and everyone who's been abused this way, um, we've had to learn the hard way, but that's our journey. And our journey has brought us to where we are here, where we're helping other people. So we can't interfere with other people's pain. We have to let the, allow them their journey. And that's not easy when you are a highly empathetic person because of you know your background and the other thing that i noticed um mm. that there's there's never been um this is a rule that i've never seen any exception to every child of narcissistic abuse has empathic sensitivity as an adult every single one of them which makes healing a lot harder because you were saying like being around people being it hurts because you're absorbing everything around you so until you learn that aspect of who you are um and learn that you know how to not absorb it you know we have a lot to overcome yeah a there's lot. a lot i feel in my own journey like and plus i want to forgive everybody so like and i, I realize that some some of that forgiveness for somebody like what we've gone through is a spiritual bypass so i've realized okay I, that's not the way I just make myself a doormat. Like I've made myself a doormat so many times through this and like the target and like the example of like, you know, just proving their point that I'm the wrecked one and I'm the broken one. And you know, it's me, look me, I just fell apart again and I got upset. And so my ex-husband is also in this pattern. So the two of them are best friends, of course. So like, you know, it's like, it's like a, woo, it's just so, I feel like I just, um, but I also don't hate them. You know what I'm saying? Like I've had those feelings of like betrayal right. and those feelings of hurt. Like, wow, once I saw what was really going on and I started talking about it and meeting people like you and having these conversations, I started getting really upset. Like, wow, this is awful what I've been through. And I had some self pity. And, but then I was like, wait a second, I'm bigger than this. I can heal this. And I can be the, I can be the light that shines in this darkness. But right. even with all that, like they, and I've sent apologies and I've said, listen, I understand you're going through pain and I'm sorry. And, you know, I know that I contributed to this because I, I don't hold myself out of it. I also contributed, 
but there's never a recept there's never ever an apology back there's like only ever this way it's like it's you it's you it's you but there's never ever like wait a second i'm part of this dynamic too even with my cousin who's a psychotherapist like you would yeah. think a person like that would understand that relationships are two-way nope just yeah. like they don't, they don't learn about this at all this is a whole different thing it's psychotherapists do not learn about this in school. They have no experience with this whatsoever. And she says that basically if all the people have a problem with one person, then that the person is the problem. Right. That's, well, and I, I, I actually, I, I crossed a line and I sent a note to her boss. And I was like, this line right here needs some inquiry because in a family, that's called family bullying actually. And a family is a system that's comprised of relationships between people. Which, and a relationship between people is both people, actually. Right. And so you just use that example, family. A narcissistic family is not a family. They, they say they're family, though. But they say it, but they're, they're, they're not. They don't have your not, back at all. They're, they're <laughs> all in survival mode. Yeah. They're all stuck. Uh, yeah. You know, it, what's interesting is there is no way to apologize to a narcissist because if you put it in writing, you can write the most lovely letter with gentle words and, you know, a poet. They read a completely different letter. They yes. don't read what you write. It's a completely different thing. So there's no point. So I am no contact with my parents. And, you know, that was hard for people around me to deal with because they're elderly. Oh, you're going to abandon your elderly parents. Well, my elderly parents are just as abusive, if not more abusive now than they ever were. And I don't allow toxicity into my life. I can be loving from afar. And I know they're part of my soul family. I know when we all pass on, it's going to be like, okay, thanks for playing that role. You know, yeah, you did that for me. You know, I know that that's what it's about. So I'm not angry or, or unforgiving but I choose not to have it in my space at all. The threat of it, not even the feeling that, oh my God, when are they going to call? You know, I need my space clean with, without any threat. And that's how I live my best life. Everybody's different. Yeah. I have actually been no contact for over a year. And do you know what? I've made the most progress in my life that I've ever made in my business on anything. No contact with my mom has led to my number one bestseller internationally. That's been on the bestseller chart for like the last 45 weeks. Uh -huh. That's no contact with my mom. And it's still, it drags me. It hurts my heart, you know, because I do love my mom. I love my mom. Come on. <laughs> She's my mom, you know, but this dynamic is super painful. And I guess, I guess it's hard for me to understand how people can't, accept responsibility for their actions and their words, but they just can't, like some divide happens. And I've even seen her do it where she just almost like she changes over and right in front of your eyes and something that was so commonplace between the two of you, she just actually was like, I would never do that. And I'm looking at her. I'm like, oh my God, that's delusional. You do it all the time. Because so you're not dealing with it because you think you're dealing with a person. Yeah. And you think you're dealing with a mom. You're not. You're dealing with a person with narcissistic personality disorder. They're predators. They're parasites. They're not moms. They're not dads. They're not sisters. They're not brothers. They're narcissistic predators. And their entire agenda is to abuse you. And you are not dealing with the true self. So your mom is just playing a role in your life in order to manipulate you to be what she needs. And so she's not a mom in the sense of a mom. You're a mom, I'm a mom. I, my children are everything. Love is unconditional. Love is not unconditional. No, it's not. Unfortunately, yeah. you're right there. Yeah. So oh, I um, hate to admit that, but we got to, we got to wrap this up. Yeah, Boy, do. this is a tense conversation. So for anybody out there who's like, this just stirred up so much crap for me and I'm really, really upset. I want to, first of all, I want to say, go get the book. 
close encounters of the worst kind. Me, right. If you're really feeling upset right now, please. And <laughs> I, I want to offer, you know, a free 15 minute, you know, just, Hey, if I really upset right now, just, you know, we'll just have a talk. I know that Randy is there as well she, on her website. She's got a right. lot of experience in this regard. You can tell I was learning from her just now. So <laughs> Because I also am in denial about a lot of it too, because my heart just can't, can't go there. Like, I'm like, no, that can't be true, but it is true. I know it is. is. And so it's just heartbreaking. So anyway, if you're really stuck up right now and upset, please reach out to Randy, please reach out to me, whoever, you know, whatever, please get some help because you don't want to be, you know, if we trigger you, there's a reason though. There's a reason. It's because it's time. It's time for you to face it. Right, to get this out so that you don't have to have this burden hanging around your neck for the rest of your life. Yeah, you don't. And there's people that love you that get it. So hop on a call, schedule something, get the book, get support. Don't be alone. Be in community. There's community here for you. And so how can people find you, Randy? How can they get started with you? So um, they can go to my website, randyfine.com. And it's my hub. I have a page with every podcast I've ever done. I've done over 500 podcasts. Uh, yeah, I've been doing this a long time, 10 years. Um, my po- every podcast I've ever done, there's a link to that. Um, there's a page on how to contact me for um, counseling. And there's hundreds of articles that are focused in this direction. Um, and there's lots of spiritual articles too, because I do have that really strong side of me. So I do bring that in as well. So. Beautiful. Well, I will put all of that into the show notes. Thank you so much for bringing your expertise and your heart to this show. I appreciate it, Randy, for well, all that you. you are. It's so good to meet you and so good to be here. Thank you. Have good a great to meet day. you too. Okay. Bye for now, everybody. Here's your kisses on the way out. We'll see you next time on Soul Nectar.